in my lecture today and talking about a topic that I feel strongly about and which will be discussed throughout the course of the uh, week. Uh, Sesame Street, of course, we all know, is a major American institution in its own right. It's fostered learning, child development, and created a whole generation of children who are much more motivated, much more educated than their predecessors, in part because of their use of modern technology. Well, what I want to talk about today is something I feel very passionate about, and I feel it can be analyzed not only from the emotional standpoint, which is important, but also from an analytical standpoint. I am primarily an economist. I work in other areas, however, and I'm branching out into areas that could be broadly defined as human development or the economics of how we become people. And I want to try to acquaint you with, I think, what is a unified framework that frequently does not receive the attention it should. When we address problems in American society, it's very typical that we focus on a problem in a piecemeal basis, one problem at a time, looking at it narrowly, looking at it from the point of view of a silo, or looking at it from the point of view of a very focused and narrow perspective. And today, <clears throat> I'm asking you to step back and think about the problem of how we become who we are, how our social problems, or some of our major social problems, are created, and what we might do to think about uh, better ways to improve society and to motivate uh, the next generation and to increase the, the quality of American society. So I want to start by describing a few problems, but I want you to think outside the box. I want you to think more broadly about how it is we can essentially shape skills and create people who live meaningful lives. So let me motivate my discussion by a few, discussing a few problems, which I think may not be fully appreciated <coughs> in the public domain. They're not uniquely American problems, but they are problems that should concern every American. And the first problem that I would discuss is the question of polarizing of American society. We see a widening income inequality. This is much discussed. Many presidents in the last three or four, uh, among the, the last three or four presidents have had to cope with widening income inequality. But more deeply, there is a polarization in American society. What we're seeing, and this is a fairly unique phenomenon, at least unique for the last half of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century, is that American society is polarizing. A greater percentage of children are attending and graduating college than ever before. At the same time, if we look back 40 years ago, a greater percentage of American children are actually dropping out of high school. So what's happening in American society today is that a large and growing segment of society that is neither working nor going to school, that is dropped out, and at the same time, a larger group of society <coughs> that's reaping the large-scale benefits of, uh, of higher education and social attachment. <clears throat> now, America is not unique in this regard. There are parallel developments that are occurring in Ireland, the United Kingdom, and many other countries around the world. But today, I want to focus primarily on the American scene because it is so central to the most of our lives. And what I want to argue today is that these adverse outcomes, the fact that we're having these two societies, the fact that a group of people is now becoming increasingly detached from the larger society is linked, at least in part, to low levels of ability and motivation in the population. And so I want to describe something today which may not be completely in fashion, but I think is extremely important that we understand. And some of these are almost homilies, and so if I sound like I'm saying the obvious, in some places I am. But I will say this, that when I talk about some obvious points, that some of these obvious points don't make their way into economic and social policy. That we, in fact, today do not, in fact, operate on what I think our gut instinct would tell us is are, are, in fact, powerful and important forces which we ignore when we design policies and think about how to solve and, and make a better America. So let me make a few points and try to document them with some examples. First of all, Abilities play a very powerful role in creating excellence. And they also, lack of ability and motivation, it creates a big problems for society at large. 
And what I think is important to understand is that I use the word abilities, that it's a plural. That abilities are actually multiple in nature. And that we have to understand that, even though that's an obvious point. When we think about the way we evaluate schools, even the way we evaluate entire societies, we typically think only of one aspect of ability, cognition, the ability to solve a, a problem, to do an IQ test, or to take a reading test. But what we need to understand and to really address the problems at the core is that abilities are multiple in nature, and they involve not only cognitive ability, but social-emotional skills, things that have to do with self-regulation, things that have to do with character. And it's this which is a neglected dimension of social policy. Now, I want to make another point which has recently been documented, not only in human populations, but in animal populations that can resemble human populations in many ways, <clears throat> where we have similar biology and the like. What we've learned is that ability gaps between the advantage and the disadvantage open up very early in life. And many of the gaps that explain so many of the outcomes that are, are causing problems or creating solutions, many of these ability gaps are formed long before people start school. But they're not all genetically determined. And so what we've come to understand is that parental environments, experience, environments that essentially have to do with successful families, with character training, with institutions that foster abilities, these are the sources of information, these are the sources of excellence in a society, and we frequently neglect this in designing our social policy. So I want to describe with you some data from early intervention programs that show how changing the lives of disadvantaged children in particular, children who don't have the advantage that many middle-class children would have, how these interventions essentially can promote excellence and foster attachment with a larger society. But I want to try to understand, or get you to understand today, what we call in economics uh, the technology of skill formation. It's a very intuitive idea. It's basically the idea of any organism starting at its earliest years, building on the foundation created in the early years, and then producing a structure and a superstructure that takes one throughout the entire lifetime. What we've learned is the early years are extremely important. They're not all just a matter of genes, as I'll say repeatedly throughout this talk, although genes play a role. But early environments play a much more important role and play a role that has been neglected in a lot of our current social thinking. We also know that later interventions, programs targeted towards children thinking of dropping out of high school, job training programs, literacy programs, those programs have a role to play. But what we've also learned from many, many economic evaluations of these programs is that the later interventions are less effective, especially when we start thinking about some of the important non-cognitive and social-emotional skills that are so important in economic life. And so what we've learned from a pure calculation, and here I'm going to take my role as an economist, we compute rates of return, just like you do for a bond or a stock. You can also compute the rate of return to say, what happens when you add another teacher in the classroom? Or what happens when you intervene in the early years of life of a child? And what we've learned is that the return on later interventions that are targeted towards adolescents who are disadvantaged, those turn out to be fairly low as they're currently constituted. It's not saying that something better can't come along or that society shouldn't innovate. But right now, given what we know, we know that the greatest opportunities for improving the lives of human beings come by intervening in the early years. And I want to talk about the biology and the neuroscience that actually creates this. But the slogan that motivates a lot of this work would be that skill begets skill and motivation begets motivation. That we are dynamic organizing agents. We know that neurogenesis, the formation of new brain cells, continues on into old age. We know that we are flexible creatures. We know that we can adapt and we know that we can continue to learn. But what we also need to know is that we, the most important years are the malleable early years, years that begin before children enter school and years that essentially are neglected by a lot of our social policy today. And so I want to try to use this concept of multiple skills, the technology of skill formation, to organize a large body of evidence and to suggest how it is we can improve American society. <clears throat> 